Okay, an apology up front because there seems to be really bad sound from me during this whole episode. I don't know why that is, uh, but hopefully I'll find a way to stop that from happening in the future. So I apologise, but I sound like Robo Marv all the way through this. Anyway, I hope you still enjoy the episode. Welcome to Pods Like Us. I'm Martin Clubell, known to my friends as Marv, and with me this time I've got Anthony Rotuno from Glass Onion, a John Lennon podcast. How are you, Anthony? I'm doing very well, Martin. How are you? How's your uh, new adventure going? Is it going well? Like, like I said to you before we recorded, you know, I'm getting better all the time. Good luck to you. I'll just say that now. Um, Thank you very much. You're welcome. (laughs) I'm I'm putting all of these out in order so that people can see me going from absolutely terrible to slightly better. (laughs) To legendary by the end of it. Yes. I'll be an expert. (laughs) So how were you introduced to the world of podcasting in the first place? Um, I actually got introduced to the world of podcasting. It was um, when I lived in London about 10 years ago, I used to work with activist i was quite interested in in things like that and i don't know when podcast exactly started but when i got into it they were a sort of alternative almost an alternative news source which i suppose they still are but i think in those days you had more of an a clear alternative media to the mainstream media i think now you've got sort of a lot of crossover so um and so for example joe rogan the joe rogan experience when it first started was not quite what it is now. I mean, I think he's still maintaining his integrity, but it was very much an alternative. So that was how I got into it. And um, I just thought it was wonderful. It was like, um, it was like listening to the radio, but not having to listen to all the bits you weren't interested in. It was getting straight to the, the, all the good bits. So um, I just became, uh, I became an addict of, uh, I became a podcast addict pretty quickly. And uh, so sort of through alternative media, I'd say, originally. So from there, would, how did you uh, first think about starting the podcast and how then did you get it started? I mean, I had it in my mind for years. I mean, like I say, I started listening to podcasts probably about 2010, perhaps, or 11. And I just had it in my mind for ages because uh, I've been, I was born in 75. So I've been into the Beatles since sort of the late eighties, since I was about 13 or 14, fairly hardcore really. And, uh, it just been in my mind for ages and I procrastinated and I had, uh, you know, some technophobia to get over with. Uh, and it was about the end of 2018. I just thought, Oh, you've, you know, you've really got to do this. And, one of the things was that I, I started contacting people and I contacted Rod Davis, who was one of the original quarry men. And he, yeah. And he immediately said, yeah, no problem. We'll do uh, an interview or, you know, I prefer to call them discussions, but whichever word you want to use. And I thought, well, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, and he, and I was thinking, and he said, yes. And I thought, well, if one of the quarry men's willing to talk to me, you know, I've got to do this. And, I just did it, you know, I ummed and ahed a little bit, but once I'd recorded the thing with Rod and I 
I had a few more ideas. Uh, I had sort of five or six people in mind at the beginning, and I had the idea of sort of using some of my psychology knowledge to kind of to bring another angle to the the, the John Lennon discussion. So it kind of went from there, and I I did the interview with Rod uh, January two thousand nineteen. So coming up for two years since I started. You've grown very, really quickly, then, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's these kind of things. They tend to grow by osmosis to some extent. But I did a fair amount of marketing. I mean, marketing is not something that comes naturally to me at all. I kind of hate it, really. But uh, I suppose doing it online, it's a bit easier than having to sort of go out in the street and give out flyers and <laughs> do stuff like that. But uh, I just. Once I started, you know, you will absolutely find this. Once you started and you hit your stride and you, you realize how much fun it is and how rewarding it is. You know, I had all this accumulated knowledge. And I, at some point I just said, oh, you know, you've got to go for it. So I started becoming a bit better at marketing the podcast. But the amazing thing really, another one of the inspirations was the fact there are no, don't seem to be any other John Lennon podcasts. I mean, um, Jude Kessler had one called the John Lennon Hour which is still online, but she has, she's got another show now called She Said, She Said. So I think I'm the only sort of specialist John Lennon one. So that, that was big motivation as well. And I suppose, obviously, the name John Lennon is going to attract a certain amount of people to, to podcasting. So I'm fortunate in that way. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just been loads of fun and it, it, it tends to grow naturally. And when once you know people, of course, and listeners will start listening to a lot of the similar shows, then they learn of your podcast by then. But, you know, they, however good the show may be, you know, you have to let people know about it. So there's a certain amount of marketing involved as well. Well, there is quite a family of um, Beatles-related <laughs> podcasts around there, aren't there, that are oh, friends absolutely. with each other? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So um, how would you describe your show to people because it's it's not just looking at john's music there's more to it there's the mm. psychology and everything else which is completely fascinating mm. um i suppose i mean they have this expression in america deep dive which has become very popular uh, particularly with podcasts because obviously podcasts there's no there's no uh, restriction on length so <laughs> there's one podcast i listen to um called those conspiracy guys and they they have episodes of up to eight hours so <laughs> uh, i listen at one and a half speed <laughs> sometimes but um i mean it's a passion project I, I think the thing that perhaps marks mine out from some other ones is is that i personalize and um i haven't really done too many solo episodes i've done i don't know four or five but um Episode 36, which was uh, episode 35, was looking at John Lennon's assassination. And then episode 36 was quite a serious deep dive into um, kind of associations. I, I, um, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit much to go into at the moment. But uh, yeah, it's a deep dive and, and it's very personal. And it, you know, it's a real catharsis for me, to be honest. I mean, that's one of the other things. I didn't. I never really set out to do a kind of slick radio show. You know, I, I always, I was inspired by you know Joe Rogan and other people. I mean, in those days, Joe Rogan's show, you know, two and a half hours was a long podcast. Now I don't think it's that long. You know, a couple of mine have been two hours. So I'd say it's a passion project and um, a real deep dive into John Lennon. Like you said, using psychological knowledge. I'd say, yeah, hmm. a bit like when you had. Um you had uh, Ben, who I've already talked to, Ben Bull, you had him on, and that was mm. really interesting because you were talking about the things that that John had in common with Bob Dylan and yeah. vice versa, and that, that was that was a fascinating discussion as well. Yeah, I mean, Ben's great. I mean, we, we got on really well, and he's obviously a professional DJ, so I knew that he'd, he'd be a good guest and he'd know what he was, know what he was doing. Um, yeah, that, that was an interesting conclusion that we sort of reached uh, – that that maybe Lennon and and Dylan were a little bit too similar in some ways, so they were kind of a threat to each other. So, um, yeah, I mean, when I say psychology, I mean uh, it's not really, you know, just in case people are going to be put off by, you know, the idea of using lots and lots of psychology, psychological concepts. It's more uh, more like a deep dive, you know. 
it's more um, just looking that little bit further because I think the facts of John Lennon, even though they're changing, you know, <laughs> as we're finding, you know, with all these great Beatle books and podcasts coming out, what what we thought we knew may not be the case, but uh, I think a certain number of facts are already well established. So I think looking deeper into them is the way to sort of forward the discussion. I'd say. Yeah, I think I think John um, sort of had a way of fueling that mystery that mm. that was there. Anyway, I don't, I don't think that John was always one hundred percent showing who he really was. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, when you, you, you'll obviously know the the Lennon remembers interview, the December nineteen seventy interview. I think certain books on John Lennon have really kind of taken him at his word. But you know, as he said to George Martin when they met at the Dakota about a year before John Lennon died, you know, he said, oh, "I was off me head," you know, <laughs> when I said that. Or you know, and, and, and Hunter Davis, you know, who wrote the only authorized biography of the Beatles. I don't know if this was word for word, but he said uh, he said that John Lennon said to him that oh, sometimes I just make stuff up, well, not not make stuff up, but but sort of come out with stuff off the top of it, off the top of my head, and um, that's why one of the things on the show that we've concluded was that if John Lennon was around now, he'd spend a long time writing angry tweets to people and then having to apologise for them. <laughs> you know, he's a very impulsive guy, but uh, I. Yeah, I mean, he, I was going to say in that Lennon Remembers interview, he called, you know, Paul the, the great PR man. But I think John wasn't too bad at that himself, you know. He told a few uh, porky pies, as we say in England, you know, a few lies. He did. About uh, his guitar being hung up for five years and all that kind of thing. But, uh, you know, it's a game. I mean, John Lennon also said in interviews, you know, that the music industry, like like life, is a game. So, you know, you have to be a bit canny every now and again. Yeah. We, we, all, we, all, we all know that he touched his instruments during those years because this footage of it and video and sound yeah. recordings as well. Absolutely, yeah. It's this bootleg between the lines. I think I think it was in the Philip Norman book. And in fact, Ken Womack just uh, sent me a PDF of his book because I'm going to be talking to him soon. He's just written a book called John Lennon 1980. And in his book, he talks about uh, a Fender Stratocaster that John Lennon had on the wall that he didn't touch. But... Uh, so I think, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not a famous rock star, <laughs> but uh, I imagine if you're a public figure, you you kind of, you, you I don't know, spin the story slightly. I mean, nowadays, you you know, John Lennon, would, like any rock star, would have a PR machine behind him, probably literally telling him, not telling him what to say, but advising him on, you know, in those days, I think it was a bit more sort of Wild West. It wasn't quite as controlled as it is now, but. You know, he so he wasn't he wasn't lying as such, but sort of spinning stories. I think I think he was good at that, and and Paul's good at that. So about that nineteen seventy period of John, where he was being interviewed, hmm. I think you're right. I think that the problem with that is that John was in a he was still very sore about his falling out with. Paul specifically, where mm. obviously his answers to questions people were asking would be very anti-Paul because he was very angry with Paul at that time. Whereas over the years, that that softened, and he, and he, and he I mean, they became friendly by the time that you know Toot and the Snore came and came about in seventy four, was it? Seventy four, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they were ever like super, super friendly um, after that. Well, I mean, again, we don't know. I mean, I don't know if they met too much in the seventies when they met in 76, we know. And, uh, you know, there's that wonderful TV movie called two of us. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's, it's wonderfully kind of, Oh, it's, it's, it's very much a TV movie, you know, and it, it plays with the facts a bit, but I, I, I thought the guys who Gerard, Oh, what's his name? Jared Harris and Aidan Quinn did a fabulous job as John and Paul. I highly recommend that. I think that's on YouTube, actually. I need to watch them because I like yeah. the actors as well. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good. Um, 
what was the question? Yeah, 1970. Well, I mean, you can't really talk about that interview without talking about primal therapy. And um, I've always had a big interest in mental health. I mean, I've had therapy myself. Um, I've read the primal scream, you know, the Yanoff book. I mean, that is heavy duty stuff. You, you know, you need to be, you need to have pretty heavy issues to do primal therapy. I mean, it wouldn't be recommended for everyone. So I think, you know, he'd really plumbed the depths of his soul and all these hurts. And I think, I think it was a combination of, you know, everything that he, he sang about in the song mother, you know, the mother and father leaving him and, and Paul, I think in a funny way, this is really conjecture on my part, but perhaps the primal therapy almost reduced him back to a child sort of yeah. temporarily. Cause he, if you listen to the audio that, I mean, I think, I think the written version of the Lennon Rembers interview sounds, I think I've got this the right way around. People have taught, have said that the audio version doesn't sound as cutting as, as the written version. Uh, maybe it's the other way around. I can't remember, but he does, when he goes off on one, he does sound a bit like a child, like a, a wounded child. So, but really, like I say, I, I wish they wouldn't always use that for these documentaries. Cause I think that was one period of his life. And I think, you know, coming out of primal therapy he was in a very very fragile and a very kind of heavy state of mind what would you say is the importance of the guests that you have and how do you go about arranging those guests um i mean you know the guests are very important because like i say out of uh, i think i'm on 52 shows now i've only done five or six solo so the vast majority of being the guests i mean I would say that the majority of people I've talked to before I've talked to them, I've been able to listen to podcasts that they've been on, or, you know, there might be interviews on YouTube or I'd say the vast majority I've already heard them speak. So I, I'd, I'd have some idea of, you know, their style or, or what they're going to say. And, um, I mean, yeah, they're very important. I mean, I mean, I suppose being an English teacher, I've, I've been an English teacher for the last 17 years and I suppose I've become good at establishing rapport with people. So I'd say that's one of my strengths. So I think the rapport thing is important. And one thing I do, I sometimes, especially if it's quite a complicated topic, I have like a prelim a prelim discussion and uh, Jason Barnard, who you've already talked to, he and I planned to have a sort of 20 minute prelim discussion. I think we were about an hour and a half just having a chat about what we were going to talk about. So that's quite important. So the rapport thing is very important as much as finding them. Like you say, now, now I'm in the sort of, I'm in the family, so to speak, the Beatles podcast family. Yeah. It's not, it's not difficult to find people. And you, you know, it's, I have issues with social media. You know, I could, I could easily criticize it for certain things, but you can't deny that it's a very good way to sort of gain access to people um dan richter for example i mean dan richter not only lived with john and yoko but he he was uh if if you and the listeners know the film 2001 a space odyssey he's the ape at the beginning he throws the bone into the air yes, which good. then turns into a spaceship you know you know the most famous jump cut in the history of cinema that guy was on facebook I saw that we had mutual friends. I said, hi, Dan. Five minutes later, he's agreed to be on my show. I mean, you know, it's not, can't be bad, can it? That's good. So it's, it's just so easy to access people. And I haven't really found anyone who's sort of been difficult. I mean, even if they were difficult, they wouldn't want to look difficult. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's just been very easy. But to answer your question, yeah, it's very important. And I kind of, I kind of, I kind of established the rapport before we start recording, you know, that's, that's one of my uh, tricks, if you want to call it that. Would you yeah. say it's a bit like, um, I was talking with Tom and Andy from Two Lakes mm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, previously, and they were saying that in a way with the guest, it's more about, they've actually, they've actually got the information and it's just you that's, you've just got to glean that information out of them. Um, Possibly, I, I think, as we were saying earlier, I, I, I see it more as a discussion. So 
I don't tell the guests specifically, but I do say to the guests, you know, if you'd like to kind of go on a tangent or chuck a question back at me, feel free. So I don't know if I totally agree with that. I think it just depends on on the style. I, I think the guys from Two Legs, they often have an authors on. So they had, for example, um, is it Paul Salowitz? Is it Chris Salowitz? That's it. That's yeah. I, I think if you've got an author on who's written a book, for example, or someone who's quite a big name, then I think that although it's not, although it can still sound like a discussion, that's perhaps a bit more of an interview because you've got the star, if you want to call it that. But I don't think, I mean, Dan Richter is a fairly well-known name, but I don't think I've had sort of, uh, I don't, this will sound really bad. I don't mean to demean it. Right, I think I've got the question. Actually. Yeah. Uh, that's all right. It's all right. I don't mean to demean any of my guests, but what I'm saying is that I haven't had any big stars, uh, you yeah. know, hugely well-known public figures. I think if I did, or I had um, sort of high-profile authors, I think it might go a bit more like that. But I, I try and make it kind of fifty-fifty if I can. What, what I meant was actually mm. was that what he was saying was that um, they pick guests who've already got that knowledge there, so that mm. makes it easier. So they've got that knowledge to be able to fall back on, like when when they're talking to. Uh, so when they did this show about, they did the show about working with George Harrison or something, mm. and they had Ken Womack on, and they said because Ken had actually written two books about George, that mm. knowledge was already there. So the guests that you pick, they've got that knowledge there already to help to make it easier. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Ben Burrell is a great example because he, he although, although I'm a pretty big Bob Dylan fan, he, he does a podcast about Bob Dylan, as you well know. Um, so he's probably more of a Dylan scholar than I am. So that that was a really nice one because I had more Lennon knowledge than him. He was a fan of John Lennon. But so it was a, it was very nice. And I've just, I recorded a show actually with um, uh, a fella called Ghosty. He's uh, hasn't gone out yet. I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's a radio DJ as well, and he's a big Elvis fan. So I did a sort of uh, John Lennon Elvis talk, which hasn't gone out yet, and it was a similar thing. I mean, he, Ghosty knows a lot about John Lennon, but uh, it's it's nice if yeah, you can sort of you and the guests can fill in each other's gaps, so to speak. I think that works really well. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, certainly everyone I've spoken to has been highly knowledgeable about their subject. So yeah, hmm. but definitely, definitely, I consider the conversation a kind of a team effort, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. you, you can throw any questions back at me as well. By the way, oh yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so what guest would you love to have that you've not had yet? Ooh, interesting. I mean, I've got a fairly big list. Uh, I was in talks with a lady called Helen Anderson who went to art college with John Lennon. Okay. And um, although Helen is in, apparently I haven't met her in the flesh, but people have met her said she's still in very good health. You know, she is 80 or late seventies. Um, so these people unfortunately are not going to be around forever. So I don't want to put pressure on her, but uh, I'd like to get her on the show um, at some point. I think the guests it's not specific guests, but I'd, I'd like to get a couple more psychology professionals on the show. I mean, I had uh, Dr. Kirk Honda. That was a good episode. We talked about, you know, the certain psychological issues that John Lennon may have had, although we took pains to say we weren't diagnosing, excuse me, we weren't diagnosing John Lennon. But um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people. One interesting thing is that this will, this will sound ridiculous, but if if somebody put me in touch with a, a sort of very famous person, I almost feel like that wouldn't work as well because the fact that people I've had on my show are well known, but they're not huge names that works in my favor. Cause I feel like, you know, obviously if Paul McCartney wants to come on, you know, open invitation, Paul, but he's yeah. probably going to be quite guarded. And the other thing is that people who've done a hundred or 200 interviews before they're going to find themselves falling into the same pattern of answers. So I think the fact that the people I've had on aren't famous has really worked in my favor. So um, to answer your question, yeah, I'd say a couple more psychology professionals would be good. And 
I also tried to contact Rod Murray uh, through Helen Anderson. He's another one who went to art college. Uh, I'd be fascinated to talk to anyone who knew Stuart Sutcliffe. I mean, that would be a real coup. Yeah. How do you decide the topics that you're going to talk about? Um, I mean, my ideas generator never really stops going. <laughs> I have to kind of uh, temper it sometimes. I've I've just got loads of ideas. I mean, I, I I started off, as I said earlier, when I did the show with sort of 10 or so ideas. And, you know, when I sit down with a piece of paper and try and think, oh, what topics do I want to cover? It just, you know, I just end up kind of, my brain runs away with itself. and <laughs> So I don't have any trouble with that. Um, I mean, I, I, I've i kept thinking sort of the last six months that I'm going to eventually run out, but it doesn't really seem like it. I mean, I've already recorded enough shows. We're here at the end of September and got enough shows until the end of the year already recorded. So I just, I just think, you know, I guess one thing I look at is what gaps are there because – although I do listen to other Beatles shows, you know, it's a hell of a lot of time doing my own one with researching and recording and editing. But, uh, you know, I, I sometimes have a look at, you know, talk more talk or, um, the other solo ones to see what John Lennon topics, perhaps they're not covering. So I, you know, but, uh, you're always trying to find little gaps. And I think the psychology one is, is the gap that other people perhaps don't explore in big depth. Yeah. How exactly do you do that research? Um, I mean, a lot of the information's kind of already there. You know, as I said, I've had a lot of accumulated knowledge. But, uh, you know, books, I mean, it, obviously if there's an author, I mean, I had Ken McNabb on last year, very, very nice fellow, by the way, and his yeah. book, um, And In The End. That was a case where it was a new book, so I obviously ordered the book, uh, I read it and took notes as I was reading, but... A lot of it, uh, we did a show about 1972, which was John Lennon's sort of the height of his sort of new left politics. So I reread the the wonderful book Come Together by John Wiener. So I'd say books, um, obviously internet research. I One of the things that has proved quite popular in my show is audio clips. And I get those from uh, YouTube. I've got a massive audio archive. I mean, I used to collect boot bootlegs and... Um, so I had CDs and I made them all into MP3 files. So I've got a pretty huge archive of audio materials, but yeah, basically books and internet research really. And yeah. And listening to other people's podcasts, of course, <laughs> and nicking a few ideas. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember that quote. <laughs> Don't make that the headline. All right. <laughs> um. <laughs> Do you actually structure each episode and do you have it pre-written out or, or is it a stream of conscious? Um, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, when I do solo episodes, um, obviously the responsibility for the conversation is all on myself. So that would be a bit more, but I don't think I've ever written out sentences. I don't, I don't work from a script. I mean, I know, um, as you said, Ben Burrell, he, he produces audio essays for his uh, podcast. And I mean, they, they sound great, you know, I'm not knocking that at all, but um, at the same time, I, th I use prompts basically. So if it's, um, um, you may have heard some of them. I've, I've been doing a kind of a series, John Lennon in, you know, and we've done 66, 65, 72, 1980, et cetera. With those ones, um, I research the events of the year, which um, tends to always be dominated by Vietnam. Um, you know, years like 66, 72, you know. So obviously, yeah, I, I research world events, so I'd have them written out. But with the guest, you know, I trust myself and I trust the guest and I trust the rapport we have that a lot of the conversation will just kind of carry itself. And the other thing is I spend a lot of time, I edit it pretty carefully, which uh, is, you know, I, I probably spend almost too long editing. I, I'm perhaps a bit too perfectionist, but so something in the middle. Yeah. I, I, I have prompts and I, I kind of, there's a certain element of trust. I think I could say with me and the guest that the conversation will flow. Yeah. How do you actually edit and record the show? Then? 
I use the cheapest uh, equipment available. <laughs> I, I'm looking at my wonderful mic here. This is a blue blue Yeti, it's called. I think the company is blue and the type is called Yeti. And then I use Audacity. And uh, it hasn't failed me too badly. And I have a sock on my microphone for a pop filter. <laughs> That's how down home it is. But... Uh, no, so, I just that's okay because the studio I used to work at when I used to work in the recording studio, we used mm. to use a somebody we used to basically buy tights as uh, pop shields. Right. Well, yeah, tights are traditionally, uh, yeah, they are traditionally used as a pop filter. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I probably still have a little bit of a technophobia, so I, I it, it's a bit. Maybe it's a bit of a cop out that I'm still using, uh, still using this. But maybe I'll upgrade at some point. But I'm um, I'm comfortable with it. You know, it's all right. And I use um, I used to use Skype, but I tend to use Zoom nowadays because, um, despite what they tell you, if there's two of you in a Zoom conversation, there's no uh, there's no time limit. And weirdly enough, in fact, I recorded a show with two other people, so there were three of us in the conversation. And it didn't kick us out after 40 minutes. We did two and a half hours. And then at, after the end of the conversation, when I'd logged out, it said um, it tried to get me to upgrade so I could get more than 40 minutes, but it just let me have two and a half hours. So I couldn't quite work that one out. But uh, yeah, sort of Zoom and Audacity and a Blue Yeti mic served me well. And I'm stuck with a cheap um, <laughs> thing that I bought from <laughs> From where, sorry? I think I bought a cheap one. Did I get it from Asda or something? Got, oh. There are other supermarkets, by the way, uh, <laughs> which, which irritates the heck out of me because I've got these really nice, sure, and these really professional microphones that I mm. can't use in a computer stand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I had, I had a bit of trouble recently, actually, with um, someone, someone recorded our um, discussion on very professional equipment, and when I transferred it to Audacity to start editing it, it, it started crackling. So I think maybe sometimes expensive stuff and cheap stuff don't always sync together. I don't know. But uh, there's a certain amount of trial and error in all these things, you know. How did you discover mm. the Beatles and John? Um, well, I mean, growing up in England, as you'll know, you know, the Beatles are, are always going to be around, you know. Um but yeah, in the 80s, I would say pre-anthology, obviously the anthology was mid-90s, there, there had been a sort of a bit of a drop-off in interest of the Beatles. So although they were around, um, I credit my older sister, Marina, who probably doesn't listen to my podcast, but, you know, it'd be nice if she did, but hi to her if she's listening. <laughs> it was the Oldies and Goldies album, you know, which was a compilation that they originally brought out in Christmas 66, because they didn't have a Christmas record that year, and the Ray Coleman John Lennon biography. And, uh, oh, and also the Imagine 1988 film. Sort of, a, it was a combination of those things, and I was just so, just captivated. I mean, with the oldies and goldies, I think the thing that, <clears throat> the thing that um, really made me take notice was, you know, I was this is in the eighties and eighties pop wasn't bad, but tended to be sort of quite long drawn out. You know, you'd have a, I was listening back to some of it recently and I always felt like the singles were always 30 seconds to a minute longer than they needed to be. Yeah. So when I suddenly heard she loves you and I want to hold your hand, it was just this explosion of energy. And the fact that it had been happening 25 years earlier before I was born, it almost added to the magic of it. It was like, wow, you know, I knew the Beatles, obviously I knew the name, but I never knew this. And then on the same record, you know, you had Eleanor Rigby and, and Yesterday and Michelle, and you're like, wow, how could this possibly be two years later? And then I, then I heard Strawberry Fields and I'm the Walrus, and I'm like, what? You know, it was just crazy. And So I'd say that. And then with John Lennon, yeah, I had the John Lennon collection, which is a, was um, a, an early compilation and the Imagine 88 film, and I, would, I was just absolutely captivated. And um, as a, This is very cliched, but when I got the Ray Coleman book, I started reading it, and I, I used to go home for lunch uh, on my bike from school, and uh, I didn't go back to school in the afternoon. So 
after the reading of John Lennon's conduct at school, he quote unquote inspired me not to go back to school, but uh, I'm not encouraging that by the way, if there's any young uh, people listening, <laughs> but uh, I think it was just this sort of, I mean, the, I think with the Beatles, it was the early stuff was the energy and the, the way it just kind of, and the way they were produced. So you had an instant, you know, hard days night, you had that chord. I feel fine. You had the feedback. She loves you. You had the drum fill. And then just, just the journey of 63 to 69, it just seems so all encompassing. And I think the other, the, another early book was the uh, complete recording sessions by uh, Mr. Lewison. Wow. And, uh, well, yes. Just all, just all those things. I mean, I was just absolutely captivated. And I went through a sort of two, three year journey of just full immersion and uh, never looked back really. And then, at the point where I kind of knew all their music, suddenly you've got isolated tracks and then all these Beatles podcasts turn up and there's all these books and it seems like the story is never going to end really, don't you think? <laughs> I think so, yeah, but there's so much there to, yeah, it's it's strange. What was it someone was saying that you go into it thinking, well, and some people will say, well, um, there can't be much there and then suddenly you find that the more you, you dig, the more there is there to actually pull out of that short period, especially with John. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we lost John when, when we did. Yeah. But there's just so much there still to be able to get from that little time that he was there. Yeah, I mean, he, he just, he packed so much into his life. I mean, yeah, it's funny to think, isn't it? Because, I mean, his solo career was basically, I suppose you could say it started in 69, Um I dis disregard the the two versions, Life with the Lions, to some extent. But uh, let's say his pop rock career kind of started with Give Peace a Chance of Cold Turkey, and it was eleven years. And then he kind of took five years off again, as we were saying earlier. He didn't stop playing music, but he didn't have any official releases. So you talk about six years, really, and about six or seven albums. But I think I think with him, he not only did he pack a lot into his life. I mean, you know, if if you look at a a sort of uh, calendar of 1969. There's a John Lennon, there's a book called the John Lennon Encyclopedia. I think it was Bill Harry did that. And if if you just chart 1969 from January to December, the amount that he packed, him and Yoko packed into that one year is uh, quite amazing. And I mean, I've been very inspired by him to do that. I mean, I pack a great deal of sort of learning and researching and reading and stuff. You know, I don't like, I remember on the Imagine 88, Aunt Mimi says, uh, you know, he never wasted a single moment. You know, he was always either reading or writing poetry or drawing. And I've kind of emulated that in my own small way. Um, I don't really like wasting time, like watching kind of rubbish on TV. I like to use my time productively. So give him credit for that. But And I think also so much of the stuff he did was so memorable that, you know, other people could have a sort of mediocre career of 20 years, but it didn't really matter that he had a short career because it was so memorable and it was so packed with incident, you know? So it's, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think all four of them were like that. I think all four of them have got this thing in them where they don't stop. They're always doing something. Mm. Yeah. I mean, especially Paul. Yeah. I mean, uh, what do you, uh, can I chuck a question back at you? What do you, um, I'm not, a massive aficionado of Paul's solo career, but would you go along with the thing that he's released maybe too much stuff and maybe if he'd only released two thirds of it, it might have been better? How do you what do you think about that? I don't think Paul is the best um at choosing what to release sometimes. Mm. But when he when he records so many songs for his album sometimes I think he's I think his selection process isn't quite so, uh, but it's it's a tricky one really because I like the experimentalism of Paul, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah. But yeah, the the problem with Paul is, but then again, you find that with a lot of artists, you find it with Prince and uh, artists like that who release so much. There's a there, there can be an oversaturation. You don't allow the the public time almost to get used to you not being there. It's, mm -hmm. it's a bit like, um, if you put it onto, onto another side, if you had David Bowie, 
because you had so long between his releases. Mm. When he released something, it was like, oh, this is a David Bowie album. So you've almost not got the time with Paul to, to get that hype because it's like, oh dear, there's another Paul McCartney album. So, mm. yeah. I mean, there's even a funny parallel with podcasting because um, I'm, I'm sure you listen to something about the Beatles and the Beatles Naked. I mean, they 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 space them out, particularly the Beatles Naked, but they they did put out very long podcasts. You know, it could be two two and a half hours. And I mean, personally, I, I probably went a bit too quickly. I, I I got so focused on fifty episodes. You know, when I got past about thirty. I was like, I want to do 50 episodes and I absolutely race them out, you know, because some of mine are pretty long. They could be up to two hours. And, um, and then I took a month off or, or I had a, I had a sort of energy crash, which wasn't totally unexpected. Uh, but then I took a month off and, uh, some of my listeners who sort of give me quite regular feedback and, um, we become sort of online friends. Um, they said, oh, you know, there's no rush because, you know, you've got to give people time to catch up. So I think I think you're right. Paul's been a bit like that. But I think, was it Larry King? It was an interview where he said, well, in the end, I'm doing it for myself, which I thought was wonderfully honest. Yeah. Do you remember that? I think that was a Larry King interview. I think so. But you've also got yeah. the thing that Paul's already got instilled uh, in there mm. um, from... Because I, I was saying to, to, to Tom and Andy from Two Legs that mm. if you think about it, when with the join the Beatles, they were always they were always either get an album recorded, record single and a B side, or yeah. on tour. So there was always that work ethic where they, I mean, it's famously said in all the, all the biographies even back then, they had very few days off, yeah. from having something to do, and so. I think Paul was the one who probably had that instilled in him more than the others. The others like to relax, whereas Paul likes to just get on. And I think he got used to that. So that when Brian died, right. and I think that Paul, I mean, John famously called Paul Beetlehead, didn't he? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, so, uh, and that was because Paul had already got that instilled and he thought that because he was the one who wanted to always be going into the studio, always wanted to be doing something or other, and which yeah. which is commendable. But the problem is that they they tired of it and really wanted Paul to lay off a bit, and they wanted to relax. And yeah, so I, th- I think that's the difference between Paul and the others, and I think that that uh, says a lot about Paul's work ethic with releasing albums. Uh, where he releases and works so so much yeah and i mean and i mean there's no you know why shouldn't he i mean that's the other thing it's there's always been this strange relationship since uh fame was kind of since modern fame was kind of invented if you want to call it that i suppose it was around the 40s or the 50s where this this sort of mega fame started and obviously it's so much more now with with the saturation of media there's this strange relationship where because someone makes money from doing a particular job, such as being a musician, they're somehow indebted to the public, not only to give up all their privacy, but to somehow do their job for other people. You know, I mean, the guy can do what he wants and if he wants to put out an album, then why not? You know, I think it depends really from the artist's point of view. It depends on, how bothered about their reputation they are. And I'm sure that, you know, Paul is a little bit careful in his interviews. We know that. So he's probably fairly conscious of his image, but I'm sure on another level, he just kind of says, what the hell? And just puts it out. And, you know, it's up to him at the end of the day. Wouldn't wouldn't you agree? I do. He doesn't owe it to the public to put more or less albums out, you know? I do, but but sometimes I think he, Sometimes I think he takes a bit too much notice to responses mm. to things that he's put out. Mm. And then if something doesn't go well, sort of like, um, I don't know how, how much you know about Paul's uh, albums or what he's released, mm. but something like the, uh, the Press to Play album in 86, mm. he took that very, very 
personally the, the backlash from that album and yeah uh, and uh, even a really good album like uh, the wings album back to the egg in 79 mm. that didn't go down very well so it's almost like he's ignored these but not realized that there's things on those that were interesting and he could have carried on with that but because of the backlash from him trying to experiment and try something new yeah and people not liking that he has a tendency to try and go back to being liked shall we say yeah i mean you know i suppose when you're i said i'm not a public figure obviously but i suppose when you're a public figure there's just your entire view of the world is, is totally different and you you've just because all, all people are really seeing is your image. I mean, obviously he's expressing his personality through his songs, but other than that, you know, you, we're just seeing a, essentially a projection of an image. So I, I imagine it goes in waves. I'm sure there's times where he just does not care what the public thinks. And then there's other times where he's thinking, well, you know, what, what's Bowie doing? Or sorry, when Bowie was around, sorry. What's, um, you know, what's Elton John doing? What's, uh, you know, I think John Lennon went kind of through the same thing because another, the, another the kind of untruth that John Lennon said, he said at various times that he didn't care what the others were doing, but anyone who's heard the audio diary from 79, he's talking about Jagger and Dylan and McCartney. Yep. <laughs> yep. I think all these, I think some people would say competition's natural. I mean, that's another tangent <laughs> for another day probably, but yeah. I guess they can't help it, you know? So I, th I think he's doing, I think Paul is doing it for himself, but I think perhaps if you're a public figure, it's just too difficult not to have an eye on what you, what's being written about you or what your competitors are doing. So, you know, am, am I right in thinking that he's never played any of Press to Play live? Is that right? Absolutely. No, he's never yeah. played any of the songs. Wow. Yeah. That's, that seems too much of a coincidence because there's, from memory, that, that that was actually one of the first studio... I think that may have even been the first of his studio albums I ever owned. So I've got okay. a special memory. And in those days, you know, when when you got cassettes and things and, you know, it wasn't a case of downloading. You were buying a cassette and you'd just... You'd, you'd play it and play it and play it, you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I actually really loved a lot of that album. You know, I, is there a song called F Footprints? There is, yeah, that he wrote yeah. with uh, Eric Stewart. Texas. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. absolutely lovely. I love that. And all the guitar, and that's beautiful. Stranglehold, and there's a song called Only Love Remains, which is absolutely beautiful. Recorded mm -hmm. live as well, Dan. Oh, was it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, I'm amazed he's never played that live, but uh, yeah, it must be a, a, a weird life, eh? <laughs> What's your favourite John album then? Can we match John? I mean, this is very easy. Plastic Ono Band. Um, we just actually did a rundown, uh, one of the shows that hasn't come out yet, but uh, that one, uh, I'd say probably for a, a fun listen, if you want to call it that, perhaps imagine, because it's it's got some of the spirit of Plastic Ono Band, but it's a bit less heavy, but um, I, I just I just love Plastic Ono Band. I think it's such a, an incredible statement. And um, of his Beatles albums, I, I think... Um, because the white album is a double album, you can, you can actually make a John Lennon single album out of just his songs. And I think, well, him know, and Paul. say again, him and, him and Paul, you could make an album from, from it. Absolutely. Both. And it's been done, of course, on another podcast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mr. Buskin's podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't my idea, unfortunately. It, but, uh, <laughs> is that the album that you'd suggest people start with when wanting to listen to John Lennon for the first time? Oh, uh, probably not. Well, Plastic on a Band, probably not. No, I'd probably say uh, Imagine. Um, for a, I think Imagine's got a nice mixture of edge and a bit more sort of sweetness. You know, the famous quote, of course, is it's uh, Plastic on a Band with uh, sugar on top or syrup or whatever the quote is. But uh, I'd say definitely Imagine is a good starting point. On a previous show, I'd actually mentioned we were talking about the Imagine album and I, I said that it was, like like you said, it's Plastic Ono Band's uh, spirit, mm. but with a fuller production. Well, much fuller mm. production. 
I mean, I don't think there's much wrong with it, to be honest. Uh, just thinking about the track list in my head, I think It's So Hard is a little bit... When, we, when I did the show with Jason Barnard, we picked our worst, in inverted commas, because we kind of said there weren't that many John Lennon songs we didn't like, but I put It's So Hard on my list because it seems just a bit very basic rock and roll without without sort of the John Lennon stamp on it particularly. So It's my than, least favourite song on that album. Oh, is it? Yeah. But I mean, other than that, I mean, some people don't like How Do You Sleep because of the sentiment, but if you just take it as a sort of really kind of funky rock song, I mean, it's... I, I think I love I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. I think it's a brilliant kind of minimalist. I like the anti-war sentiments. There's really nothing on Imagine I don't like, particularly. Same as Plastic Ono Band. There's nothing I really don't like on it. Yeah. I think we've touched on it earlier, but what do you think is the biggest misconception about John? Well, yeah, I was trying to think about this. This, this was the, the only question <laughs> I'm really struggling to answer because I, I don't, I, I would have probably said, you know, if, if we'd been here sort of, I don't know, 20 years ago, I probably would have said the misconception was that he was kind of a hard nut. But now I think that's been kind of dismantled. So it's very hard to say. I mean, uh, I did uh, one thing that springs to mind earlier this year, I interviewed Colin Hanton, my second quarry man that I've had on the show. And I actually went to his house in Liverpool and it was a, it was the most surreal couple of hours, but it was delightful. Colin was absolutely great. Because he he's got a relatively he's got a new book out called Prefab, which I think came out last year, and it was very interesting that um, perhaps one misconception that's still there is that John Lennon got into a lot of fights when he was young, but um, Colin Hanton's book is full of uh, the quarrymen running away from uh, the local hard nuts, you know, the Teds, and uh, as I said to Colin, I don't blame them because <laughs> some of the stuff that's described. You know, they would have uh, razor blades on their lapels and, you know, they, you know, Liverpool was a rough place in those days. He, even, and probably not Wilton where John Lennon lived, but, you know, if you went to neighbouring uh, Garston or somewhere like that, there's actually the Garston swimming baths were called the blood baths because right. uh, they were so rough. But yeah, I'd say the misconception was that he got into a lot of fights when he was a teenager. Um Perhaps uh, another thing that's sort of come out in recent years is that he was very into sort of quite old timey music. Um, as we know, Paul was, of course, music hall yep. and stuff. And I don't think John was as seeped in it as Paul was, but I think that's perhaps a people think that maybe he only liked rock and roll, but I think he like, I think he sort of liked the crooners and the soppy ballads more than he would have liked to have admitted. Cause because, you know, John Lennon, in one of his very last interviews, the Andy Peebles one, two days before he died, he even says, you know, I still feel like I need to be the macho guy, even though he'd almost been turned into a feminist by Yoko. Uh, there was still that little bit of him that didn't want to admit that. And I think, I think that's sort of part of growing up. I think as I've got older, I mm. mean, in my 40s now, I think Paul to me is cooler than I thought he used to be yeah. because I, my, my idea of what's cool is different. You know, now I think him putting a honey pie and Martha, my dear on the white album, it isn't uncool. It's cool in a way or, or wild honey pie, you know, that crazy song that's on side one of the white album. I think, I think the idea of what's, what's daring and what's dangerous changes as you get older. And that's uh, one thing. So um, I think, yeah, I think um, you know if you if you'd bumped into John Lennon as a teenager, you you might have found him quite intimidating. But I think if you penetrated a little bit, you know, and got to know him a little bit, you'd probably find he was mostly a sort of a softy, you know, with a with just a little bit of a hard edge. Yeah, yeah. that's my I, best I, guess. <laughs> I I think that the famous uh, quote from John where he said where he was talking about Paul's granny music as he called mm. it mm. I, I, I've i always thought that that was John trying to look macho shall we say because because he also liked music from, from back then as well but it's like somebody being asked about a certain pop group and mm. because they're trying to look cool to their friends they'll go oh that oh I don't like that because it's just you know writing it off whereas yeah. actually 
I think John actually did like it. I mean, otherwise, he wouldn't have done a great job on the guitar on, as you mentioned, Honey Pie. Because his oh, guitar yeah. work on that is, it's exemplary, it's really good. Yeah, it's amazing that he does a solo that's about only six notes or something like that, but it's so memorable, isn't it? But it's uh, perfect for the song, for that time frame that it's trying to emulate. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. What's um? There's a word for that, isn't it? Is it forbidden pleasures or something? What's that word where you you like something but you're embarrassed by it? God, I'm an English teacher, Martin. It's that guilty no, pleasures. Guilty, guilty pleasure. I, I don't you. like the word guilty pleasures. Yeah. I'm the Very English nice. teacher and you're the one who... Uh, told me what the phrase was <laughs> i've been working hard today so that's my excuse i'll let but, you all, all you. those all, the, all those kids you know do it doing you <laughs> it was actually adults i teach <laughs> all right I teach yeah. english to, to foreign adults but yeah. yeah i wish i could rewind <laughs> <laughs> just a couple of other things while, while you were talking i was thinking about that yeah it's a, it's a shame that the um the Lennon remembers this December 1970 interview is used so much. I mean, obviously, we, we lost John fairly early, so there's not a whole bunch of interviews from the 90s and beyond that can be used. But I remember when I watched the anthology in the mid-90s, um, I watched it with my then-girlfriend, and she wasn't a huge Beatles fan, but she liked them. But she said at the end of it, God, that John Lennon's always moaning, isn't he? <laughs> And the reason was because they'd used so many of these, uh, so much of the Lennon Remembers quotes in the anthology, which is a, a shame. But I think he comes across in that interview as really kind of like a child, you know, um, sort of a bit spiteful and, you know. But um, the only other misconception I could think of, I mean, I, I just, uh, the Radio Times came through my, my door today yeah. and uh, John Lennon's on the cover. And I leave through a couple of pages, and I think we're going to get the very much official version of John Lennon, uh, 1980. Uh, which, as you, you know, if you've listened to my show, people will know I, I endlessly talk about the Ray Coleman and the Albert Goldman versions of John Lennon. And um, as I said, I'm just reading Ken Womack's new book, and hopefully Ken's going to find a kind of middle ground, because I think I think the sort of baking bread domestic happiness meme has been smashed but i don't think the truth was as dark as goldman had it so uh i think there's something in the middle but i think we're gonna very much get the official version this week and the next couple of weeks yeah I'm sort of interested in finding out what um, the radio program that, that sean is doing i'm interested in finding out mm. what, what, what 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 comes out in that if anything yeah, I'm not. Uh, I think I think if Julian's on it, I think unless Julian is sort of n not changing his story, but unless Julian is watering down what he said before, I think you know a lot of the interviews he's given are pretty damning about um, John Lennon as a father. But again, you know, you can't just beat John Lennon with that stick forever. I mean, he was 22. He was a he was a he was a a guy in his early 20s who'd just become mega famous you know and uh you know he did seek to rectify that with his second son but uh yeah i don't know i haven't really heard a lot of what sean said i think i always just kind of assume that again it would be the sort of sanctioned version but yeah i'll definitely be tuning into that and it's a couple of documentaries on sky arts for anyone who's in britain sky arts is a fantastic channel have you have you ever watched anything from there I have. I love that. Yeah. Channel. Oh, isn't it brilliant? Yeah. There's a, there's a new one really called. There's a new one called Sky Documentaries as well, which is pretty good. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely be tuning in. Uh, but uh, I won't hold my breath. <laughs> Unfortunately, when this episode comes now, that will have already been on. Oh well. You. But you will be able to go back to the BBC iPlayer. And there you go. I'm sure Sky will probably have it somewhere to watch again. Yeah, and these documentaries tend to appear online fairly quickly nowadays as well, don't they? That's very true. <laughs> yeah. What's your opinion on the other Beatles and what's your knowledge of their music like? Um, I mean, I guess we've talked about Paul a bit, but uh, I mean, he, you know, he's eternally fascinating to me. I think, I think the fact that he's still around and, and he's so public, I think, 
I don't know if he's tarnishing his reputation, but I think he's some of his public appearances and some of his choices of collaborations perhaps weren't weren't the best. But uh, uh, I've recently been listening to the Nagra reel. Some lovely person put them all online, although they've now been taken down, presumably by Apple. <laughs> But uh, when I had this sort of month off the podcast and I had a f- couple of weeks off work, I listened very intently to the Twickenham part of those. And I think Paul perhaps doesn't try as hard as some people give him credit. Or, well, no, the opposite, really. I don't think he, I don't think he ch- always tries as hard as people accuse him of. I think uh, a lot of what he does is effortless. I mean, I think... I don't feel like Paul spends days and days crafting songs. I think the kernel of it comes to him very easily. And then uh, I think what was probably true in the past when he was smoking a lot of weed was probably that he just didn't put that little effort into it. Because I think most, most people who write songs will tell you that it's not difficult to write a song once you know how to write songs. And I think for Paul, because he's so good, I think it's not difficult for him to write, let's say, you know, seven out of ten, you know, songs that you'd rate seven out of ten, fairly good. But I think it's almost a choice, really, whether he wants to push that little bit more effort to make it nine out of ten, you know, or ten out of ten even. So, um, but I, I think one of my guests said it very well, you know, he's really impossible to know. He's, it's, It's very difficult to know the real guy, so... I like him, you know, I think I personally do take the view that if you took the best sort of half of his solo career, you know, the best 30 or 40 songs, you know, you've got some absolute gold there. Um, George, George, I always found interesting. I always found George, this is going to upset the George fans, uh, in some ways a watered down version of John. In that, not musically, I mean, personality wise. And I think he almost said that. He said when John left the Beatles, which I suppose officially was September 69, he, he said, I took over as the one who didn't take any shit. <laughs> so although although I don't think when you're in the 50s, you know, the fact that Paul was nine months older than George, I always found that amazing that he still thought of him as a, as a, a baby brother, you know, even when they're both in their 50s. But I see George more as a sort of younger brother of John almost. I think he did look up to John. Um, how their how their uh, relationship would have played out, I don't know. But uh, George, musically, I've always found very interesting. I like a lot of his Beatles stuff. I really like stuff like Don't Bother Me. I think that's very, very underrated. And uh, as a person, the more I read about it, I think, I think the sort of grumpy and rather bitter side of George, I think that didn't come out in the Martin Scorsese doc. You know, I think, I think, you know, when you're, when you're making these documentaries, they tend to be the sort of officially sanctioned version. I'm not knocking that because that, you know, it, it, it seems terrible to, to, to put out something very negative about someone after they've died, you know? So if, if, you know, a certain truth is going to come out, which is probably going to be mostly positive, obviously, you know, the Goldman book on John Lennon and the Lennon naked documentary, uh, not documentary, dramatization. They were very negative um, about John. But, um, uh, and Ringo, I I think Ringo would be a great person to be in a band with. You know, I think he was the glue that held the Beatles together. And apart from the walkout and the White Album, I think, I think it was no surprise to me at all that they, I think they all ended up working with him, didn't they? And they all, yeah. they all contributed songs to his solo stuff. I mean, that, that was no surprise. As far as his solo career, I mean, I, I, I barely know anything past about 1974. And I did listen to a bit of his recent album. And I, I, I just find it hard that to take too seriously. I don't know. I don't, I think as a drummer, he's fantastic, you know. And, and so do I. I think he's very underrated. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he's still underrated. I suppose to the casual fan, they, they x amount of people will still think that he was the guy who won the pool, so to speak. But I think those isolated tracks that have come out through the garage 
band or rock band, yeah. you know, they've really shown you that the stuff he was doing in the Beatles was fabulous, you know. So, yeah, that was long-winded, wasn't it? <laughs> so, as we're getting towards the end, what other podcast shows do you listen to? Um, of different topics or, or anything? Of, of any, any topic whatsoever. The, the, the idea is that, well, my idea behind this is that people might hear shows that you that you like and they might think, oh, I'll have a listen to that and see what that's like. So yeah, what yeah. do you actually listen to? Um, well, I mean, I still listen to Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan Experience. Um, uh, for history buffs, I couldn't, couldn't recommend more Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. He's, he's, you know, they're pretty long episodes. But That's the second time I've had that mentioned. Oh, have you? Who, yeah. else has, who else mentioned that? Who mentioned One of your... It might, <laughs> have it might have been. I, I don't remember. I wish I'd taken notes now. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, that's a, that's a great one. He's, he's, Dan Carlin's got a great voice and you can really hear that he's into it, you know. And um, uh, there's one called Clandestime, which I, yeah. I listen to, which is, a, again, a sort of alternative view of media in the world. Uh, there's one called The Mind Renewed, which I've actually appeared on uh, <laughs> five or six times, run by Julian Charles, who's a friend of mine. Recommend that. Um, musically, I mean, Ben Burrell's one, Bob Dylan album by album is great. And his other one called Long Player. I think Ben's Bob Dylan one. I was mm. saying to Ben that I like the fact that it's informative while not being too long. So he gets the information out there mm. and it's succinct at the same time. Yeah, definitely. And, um, I think I said in another show, when I talked to Ben, I love the way he referred to Dylan as Bob instead of Dylan. And you could sort of hear the affection in his in his in uh, Ben's voice when he was talking about Bob, um, <laughs> uh, film ones I listen to quite a lot. There's one called The Next Reel, which is pretty good, and there's one called The Essential Films podcast. They're pretty good. Um, and then obviously Beatles. Uh, oh dear, I think everyone that you've interviewed or about to interview, I've probably listened to all of theirs. I mean, I love, uh, if you really want something different, I really like Fabcast. That's an interesting one. Very forthright opinions. And then when they was fab, uh, I listened to Nothing Is Real. That's the uh, two Irish guys. That's pretty good. And then, you know, as I said, all the people that you've interviewed, two, two legs. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm hesitant about mentioning any of them because then, I'm, then I might forget the rest of them. But... <laughs> <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> they know who they are. <laughs> but uh, pod podcasts is such a wonderful thing. I mean, to produce a podcast is, is hard work, but very rewarding. But listening to podcasts, as I said right at the beginning, it's like a, it's like a radio show with all the boring bits taken out. <laughs> and uh, Well, let's hope I do a good job of editing. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Uh, yeah, I mean, I wish you, just to say, I wish you good luck and... Uh, you know, you've already got some great people on the the names that I've I've seen, and uh, you will find you will you'll hit your stride pretty quickly, and uh, it's it's a great learning curve, and it's a it's a great adventure. So good luck to you. Thank you very much. What advice would you give then to first time podcasters? Right. Um, well, first of all, go for it. Do it. <laughs> Don't procrastinate too long, like I did. Um, I, uh, I was thinking about this, um, a podcast should be different to a radio show in the sense that I don't think it should be too slick. However, there are podcasts that I've listened to that uh, there's nothing wrong with a long podcast, but some of them do just endlessly ramble. And I think there's ones I've listened to, uh, film ones, for example, uh, not going to mention any names, but um, that it just it does just sound like a load of blokes chatting about a film, but that haven't really done any research. So I think my advice would be try to find that sweet spot where it's organic and you know it's informal, like it shouldn't be slick. But I think it's a good thing to do research. You don't want it to be too. You don't want it to sound like something that literally anybody can do. You know, I think. That's my personal belief anyway. So I think if you do the research and then trust yourself that 
you know, it's going to work and that, you know, you and your guests or you on your own can carry the episode. I think, uh, yeah, find, find a sweet sort between informal and somewhat polished or, or somewhat smooth. Yeah. it's my advice. Thank you for that, Anthony. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And, um, yeah, that was, that was fun. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me on and, uh, yeah, good luck once again. <laughs> Another one in the can. Another one in the can. Another one in the bag. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you, everybody, for listening and hope that you carry on and listen again. Thank you very much. I think if you now I'm on video, can you see where you can see me in the top right hand corner? You've got some dots, blue dots, three blue dots, top right hand corner of my, the window where you can see my face. No, I can't see this now. Oh, um, uh, all I can see is, uh, well, can you see me? Can you see my face? I can see you, yes. Okay. Yeah. In the top right-hand corner, is there a, a, there's not three blue. If you, if you click in the top right-hand corner, can you see th a blue square and three, three dots? No, I've got the bit that says view. Oh. There's not three dots. Oh, it's a no. shame. Cross over to the other side. It's got the recording and... Oh. So in the rectangle where I am, nothing. Yes, I can, yeah. Nothing. Oh. It's a shame. Ooh. It... So I've right clicked and I'm pressing the allow to record. Oh, have you have you done that? I've done it. Yeah, I've just right clicked and it's come up as a uh, drop down oh. menu. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So I'm recording and you're recording. So between us. <laughs> Are you recording on Zoom as well, or just Audacity? Uh, just on Zoom. On Zoom. Oh, on Zoom. Okay, perfect. So we're both recording on Zoom, so that should be fine. Um, I'm just going to... For the future, I need to find out something. <laughs> I'm just checking that this is automatically adjusting, and I'll make sure I don't sit too near the mic. So, Yeah, I'm ready when you are, mate. Because the first person I did it with last week, he actually hosted. And uh, he was oh, able yeah. to get Zoom to give him three audio files. Oh, that's interesting. So he I'll look had into a that. so he had a uh, a file of of uh, everything all together, both mm. me and him talking. And then he had two separate files that Zoom gave him of each each different microphone. So you you could then edit both oh, one or the other. Then do that. Yeah. Not worked out yet how how to do that. With Zoom. I mean, I'll have a look after we finished. I'll have a look after we finished, and I'll let you know. But what? Whenever I record, it spits out an audio file, a video file, and then some something that just says playback, which I don't even know what that is. But right, okay, yeah. But you'll get an audio. Obviously, you won't need the video file, but you'll get a, it's an MP4, isn't it? And then it is. Yeah. Well, Yeah, M4A, that's it. Um, I'm ready when you are. Okay, thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Pods Like Us. My name is Martin Cobell, known to my friends as Marv. I'm with... Um, oh, yeah, this... I've got to... Go on. No, I've got to tell you how to pronounce my surname, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good idea because I think I've got it wrong when I say Anthony Rotuno. Oh, that's correct, yes. <laughs> sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> Go on, start again. I'm sorry. I'm going to keep quiet now. Rotuno. Rotuno, yeah. Rotuno, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry.
I know I know most of my time over the next couple of weeks is going to be spent with endless editing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how I do. Gonna, how am I going to fit that around the seventy-hour range? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said to you, I spend a long time doing it. It's kind of worth it because I, what I do is I, I edit the conversation, then I go back to the beginning and I listen to it through. And then while I'm listening to it, I think about what I'm going to put in my intro. Yeah. But I think when you hear the conversation back and it's nice and smooth, it does give you a kind of a warm glow, you know, it sort of feels like it's worth it. <laughs> well, I've got the I've got the A4 pad out to take numerous notes of each person. Mm. If you need any advice, just, just shoot me a message because I'm more than happy. I'm sure you'll find that with everybody. They're more than happy to Yeah, to even Andy you. Nichols said to me uh, last night, he said, uh, if need be, he says, th- throw me one or two of them. He says, and I'll edit them and whatever he said. Mm. I don't think like that. Have you um, done much editing with Audacity before? Only on music, never on oh, okay. this. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty user-friendly. Oh, actually, Martin, uh, you tell you what you might... Have you got any mastering uh, software? Um. Know whether I can do mastering or right because I've got a really is a, a weird sort of software called I'll write it in the in our chat levelator I've written it in the chat there um, okay. what it's supposed to do is level out the voices um, but what I find it it doesn't doesn't totally level them out but it has a funny effect of mastering it it comes out louder than it was originally okay um, but just make sure if you're going to if you're using that, make sure before you put it through Levelator, make sure it, it's nowhere near the red, yeah. because if you use Levelator, it might go into the red. So, <clears throat> well, then you get really distortion. Yeah, I mean, I, I always err on the side of um, having the level further down rather than up, yeah. you know, because then you can always sort of put it up a bit. But if it goes in the red, then you know, I mean, that's a problem. But yeah, Levelator, it's pretty good. So you just, if you download Levelator and you have it on your desktop, you literally just drag the file into Levelator and, and then it'll, you'll see the percentage and then it'll spit it back out with the word output on it. Okay. So yeah, I think that's a pretty good bit of software. That's good. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. I'll let you get on because you're. You've got mm. something on short, yeah? Yeah, I've got to go out. Okay. Do some Thanks. errands. Yes. Well, I'll catch up with you later on. Thank yeah. Thank you very much, mate. When do you think it, um, when are you planning to put them all out? Is it just a steady, uh, steady progress? Steady progress. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, like I say, if there's anything you need or, yeah, just shoot me a message. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Catch all right, you mate. later. All Take the best, care, mate. mate. Bye. See you.